This is Being Human. I'm Richard Atherton. Lizzie Remont, writer, yogi, Rolfer. Welcome. Thank you, Richard. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. So I know you, Lizzie, as as my as my Rolfer. Uh, and so let, let's start there for all the people who have got when they hear Rolf, Rolfing, maybe they think Rolf Harris, uh, that they don't, they're not sure what Rolfing is. Can, can you give people a summary of, of what Rolfing is and a little bit of its history perhaps? Absolutely, Richard. Um, so the name comes from Ida Rolf. She was uh, an American woman who was, um, she, I guess she was born in the late 1800s, just at the end of the century, and went on to uh, become a biochemist and a physiologist and was a, was a professor at Columbia for a number of years in, I guess, the 30s, 40s, this kind of time. And um, through her own fascination with, um, with physicality and also through challenges of her own, her own familial challenges, she had a son who apparently was not very much in his body. She had a, a riding accident at a certain point. And so she had these uh, physical challenges, seeing her son and how he dealt with proprioception and, and how he dealt with being in gravity. And then through her own limitations later, she worked um, very closely alongside osteopaths, uh, craniosacral therapists, and was also practicing yoga, as I understand it. And um, I guess through all of this work, she... Um, questioned more than anyone else had done to date from a, from a, I guess, written standpoint, uh, how is our relationship in gravity and how does it affect the tissues and the held spaces in our, in our body? And so from this, um, I believe the origins really were she was working with people in practicing asana and assisting and, and getting into tissue in those places. And um, well, she just took it brief, on just to... Just briefly for people who... We don't know what the what ah, asana yes. means, what's that? Yes, so, so the physical shape. She was working with people in gravity in their physical shape. And, um, and this evolved into her, I don't want to say discovery, but her belief that a special tissue in the body called fascia was actually more organ-like and ever-present than um, had really been documented before. And today, in, uh, in the modern medical and anatomical world, we now have come no, uh, to know fascia as a spider webby matrix that uh, is, um, basically exists surrounding every cell, every bone, every muscle, threaded through every type of different tissue within the body that, in a sense, is the, the glue to our, our fabric of, of our earth suit, so to speak. Mm. And, um, and so, you know, one way that for, for your um, listeners, uh, scar tissue is an example of fascia that's become bunched up and held to ad adhese ourselves. Um, but actually, all of the organs and uh, skeletal system, muscular system, are um, surrounded and threaded with this type of tissue. So it really holds our posture. And right. over time, certain habit patterns um, probably the most common is just sitting at a, at a desk or dropping to your mobile phone. Um, these patterns become held in our body and, uh, and create all kinds of issues. Now we also have mental patterns, as you probably know, um, and those um, also hold us into a space. So where we work through the body, but you know, the, the tissue actually um, holds a world of information and experience that can be um, either simply physical, but oftentimes there is, is not separate from the psycho-emotional side of, of how it is to be in our body. Hmm. So that's the long answer. <laughs> okay. long answer. So coming back to what Rolfing is, um, I guess the easiest way to describe it is a system of um, releasing the tension strains that exist within the special web. And um, we do that through table work in the form of of touch, um, not unlike a very deep, slow um, manipulation of the body. I don't want to say massage because oftentimes that's um, very superficial. Um, but it can also be through movement. We work with movement as well. Yeah. And what brought you first to rolfing? How did you? How did you get into it? Um, well, I'd been 
I guess in the realm of uh, alternative body work for some time, I am at that point, I was a yoga teacher and a uh, Thai masseur and a craniosacral therapist. And I What's had a, I'm sure, a craniosacral. So, yeah, so craniosacral therapy is another form of um, touch therapy that is uh, also in a way working with fascia, but in a much more subtle way, um, where instead of the fascia directly, there's a fluid that is also um, inherent in, in the fascial structure. And uh, craniosacral therapists work more indirectly with fascia using that fluid and the rhythmic balancing of that fluid to bring the body back into a balance. Mm. So I would say that it is a, um, it is, uh, there's something about Rolfing in the structure of the work. So there's a framework in Rolfing that starts with these 10 sessions that um, in a way is working within the structures of the body to kind of systematically reset the whole structure. Um, whereas cranial sacral therapy um, oftentimes will work with either a, um, a bigger goal, like um, you have headaches that you, you know, so there's a rebalancing going on within, um, within the work yeah, in a different way. But anyway, um, I, um, I happened to have a frozen shoulder at a certain moment in my life about uh, 10, eight years ago, something like that. And I had been to all of the other types of therapies you could think of to try and help this shoulder with uh, physiotherapy and osteopathy, uh, acupuncture, mm, these kinds of, of things. And finally, someone said, you know, you really maybe should be a rolfer. So um, that was my entry point in knowing nothing about it. I, I went in and asked, can you fix my shoulder? <laughs> and, uh, and at that point, I got kind of a shortened spiel of what I just told you about this, um, how the tissue is and the framework that normally it's not a one-off session. But um, the therapist, was the, the rolfer was kind enough to see me anyway for that one-off session. And it was very immediate. I knew that level of touch. My body craved it after having years of, I used to have an office job. Uh, I traveled a lot with my work. I was not in my body. I was a marathon runner with incredibly kind of tight um, physique. And I, I just, I knew that I did hold a lifetime of experience in the tissue that needed to be uh, unfurled somehow or unstuck. So that was my very first experience. And it worked? It has a shoulder? So after three sessions, it, it, the, sh the pain went away, but she had never directly worked in the area that was painful to begin with. So this was a very big moment for me of recognizing that something deeper was going on and that it wasn't just a sort of localized thing. And, you know, injury never really is. We're a part of an interconnected system, being human. And uh, so she was working uh, down much lower in my thorax around the liver area. Um, and um, it turned out that I, I had a liver disease. And so the liver had become adhered to the fascial uh, connection within the spine, which froze the shoulder. So it was never the shoulder. It was uh, happening somewhere else. And over time, that tension uh, showed up in an injury in my shoulder. So when it, when it was uh, resolved, I was really, uh, I was very interested to learn more about what this, what this was that was happening. And um, I found, I did a lot of research and I discovered that there were these uh, principles of role thing that really intrigued me because in a way it um, reminds me of sort of the yogic framework where at first you might think it's just about the body, but then you start to have an introduction to the philosophy of it and they, they change each other and then you have a different experience of perhaps chanting or uh, breath work and all of a sudden uh, you realize that there is this very dimensional, uh, multi-layered thing. And for me, I, I found that with, when I started to understand why are the sessions um, strategized or placed the way that they are you know there's a, a reason for all these little details um, that come up through the session and I found that really profound as a reflection that I could take out into my my life you know uh, 
my messy desk that was not structured. I started to realize, ah, there's a connection. Messy desk isn't structured, messy body isn't structured. <laughs> so I tried to, and I, I got curious about how do I create more um, organization in a semi-fixed way, you know, in my body and in my life so that I have space to move within that semi-fixed reality. Um, so, yes. You mentioned that your your liver disease, and I mean, I I read your your website before this interview, and and your story is is extraordinary. I'm like, how is she still alive, right? And and giving all that you're giving to to society. So, and that that started when you were really young, right? And is it, did right? yes, yeah. Um, when I was three, I was uh, diagnosed with uh, ulcerative colitis. Mm. Um, and actually, there's a small population of people that uh, have this disease that they're not sure if it's Crohn's or colitis, so you, they're called indeterminate. But uh, that's only important because it's, those, uh, it's that little group that um, has a, more of a risk to, for it to kind of overtake the whole uh, digestive system over time and then scar the bile ducts and eventually the liver. So it's, it's a pretty rare disease and it, it, you know, it's, it started, I guess the roots of it started a long time ago, but um, manifested in this secondary disease called primary sclerosing cholangitis that is a scarring of the bile ducts. And that, that happened uh, about when I was about uh, 33, I was diagnosed with that disease. So in that moment, that was a transformational moment um, because uh, when you're 33 years old, when I'm 33 years old, and I heard that uh, in 10 years I would have end-stage liver disease, for me that really was, in 10 years I'd be dead, for sure, mm. because the idea of having a transplant was so over the top for me. Uh, how could that even be possible to get a different, somebody else's liver, the organization, the uh, it was like rocket science, you know? Um, and so I really made a lot of changes when I was 33 because I, uh, I wanted to have a meaningful existence more than what I felt I had at that moment. And what were those changes? What, so what, what stuff? Well, I was a creative director at the time. Um, I, uh, you know, I found aspects. I, I'm very visual and, um, and, in some way, I guess those design structures help to see things, people, and gravity now. Um, but um, I was I was I was doing work for quite a few kind of um, either innovative businesses or um, or large businesses, and I guess overnight it just stopped being interesting that work um you know i was working in a way where i wasn't as hands-on with the, the the design anymore and i was working more i found myself um being more interface having more time interfacing with the business owners and the um the stakeholders and it wasn't as creative as it had been when i was younger hmm. and um I just realized that really there's more to life than selling beer and uh, electronic products. And um, yeah, it just, it became very apparent. And from one day to the next, I just really lost the thread of that old, um, of that old career. And, um, and, you know, I went into a period of um, kind of chaos, really kind of, um, you know, it's like a tornado hits you and it makes you investigate how strong the pillars that you have are in your life. And those pillars for me at the time were the environment where I was living. Um, I was living in a, in a city that it went, a town that at one point had really interested me because of the uh, interactive creativity going on. Um, but I didn't have any family there or any relationship there. My health was in steep decline. <laughs> it was a, a forest fire of a decline. And, um, and you know, my love life wasn't on fire. Mm. And so, I, you know, I didn't really have anything holding me up. And in that moment, I guess that's when really great things come to the surface um, because you're really faced with finding a meaning, finding a purpose, um, exploring... Uh, really in an immediate kind of direct way, what, what am I innately 
gifted with, what has mm. the universal forces or, you know, whatever, how, whatever your beliefs are, what have my genetic, um, what has my genetic makeup coupled with my life experience coupled with my uh, little bit of pixie dust magic of, of me, how does that all manifest and give me something to do that's worthwhile doing? And that's what happened. Mm. And, and where, and so you moved to geography as well. I mean, where, where, where I did, um, I had been moving, uh, I had been living in Amsterdam for about seven years. And, um, in order to make the changes that I wanted to make, I, I couldn't do it there for lots of reasons. I was an American living in Europe and, um, uh, financially I didn't have a, a good basis. So, Actually, um, I, at the time, my boyfriend um, was living in Kosovo and working for the UN. And it was uh, very, uh, it was like jumping off a cliff. I decided to go there, not knowing what I was going to do, but knowing that it was a space where I could be with somebody whom I loved. And uh, I, I did part-time pro bono work with some, uh, some of the charities that were on the ground. War Child was there, UNICEF was there. It was there. And I, um, I started teaching yoga to the UN and also <laughs> wow. to, um, to ethnic Albanian and Serbian women together in the back of a pub with loud Eastern European techno music, lots of cigarette smoke, and a little sheet hung up to demarcate where we were going to be practicing yoga. And it was really, and I was, I was, I was able so to what, have these women the came in with their pints and put the pint down on the side before they got to the. No, house. because these were the women. It was. It, I didn't have any men in those classes. These were these were women. But um, the thing that's interesting, though, is I was free to do two different things and to see where my energy went. Okay. And it was very clear. I really loved teaching yoga. I had never taught anything in my life. I felt that somehow naturally I could communicate something that I had experienced in, in my body um, to with other people. And it brought people together. And it was just, it was a lovely time of, of newness and that's when I decided to do my, my teacher training. And, um, and then a few months later, I uh, was on a cranial sacral Thai massage training, not really expecting that to happen. But my, my beloved dear friend was going on this course and I wanted to, to go and spend time with her. So I did it too. And then, you know, so everything kind of fell into to place. Um, I just yeah. still can't get this image out of my head of this this room in the back of the pub. I'm still imagining like guys peering through the curtain, like what the hell's going it, on here? It was just... very, very surreal. It was Are people very like surreal. coming oh, through yeah. the pub to get to the to the yoga class, yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, yoga happens in in lots of different you know ways, and that was um, that was one of the more interesting um, scenarios that I've I've had. To, to work with, but it definitely, um, I guess it is testament, you know, I think that in today's world, we get very precious about, uh, it has to be silent and there has to be these certain kind of flooring. And if, if the studio doesn't have, you know, blow dryers and uh, floor to ceiling window, uh, floor to ceiling mirrors, I can't practice it. And, you know, this was a beautiful uh, example of spontaneous yoga happening because it absolutely had to in that culture and finding a place where we could come together to make a start. And um, for me, it's, it's all about starting where you are. And we didn't waste time and, you know, there was no other place to, to come together like that. So we found a place and we made a start. And, you know, that sometimes um, I think we we make things so big in our mind that we never get to make the start. <laughs> Got to go out right. and get my perfect yoga gear. Then I need to practice in a closet with a private, uh, a private teacher for the first year so that I can make it into the class to look okay. You know, these kinds of things prevent us from just going and, and, um, and manifesting something. Right. Yeah. That, 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 correlates with a lot of the work I do with businesses and this tendency when they want to make a change to, to want to analyze it all out and make the big plan and, and get everything lined up 
before they hit go. And maybe sometimes it's just about finding a back room of a pub and yeah. <laughs> starting. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's different approaches of, of um, whether you build something top down, which is what you're explaining mm. to a certain extent, or whether you allow things to uh, happen as the earth does, which is certainly uh, like grassroots bottom up. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's really where a lot of magic happens is mm. the, the great force from the ground that um, comes together. And, you know, this is the idea behind tree life, for example. Mm. You, know, you have this huge underbelly world of roots and uh, fungi and you know, all kinds of things going on that then manifest. We only see the, the top surface, but it's the, it's the, the bottom up sometimes that you know, these tiny things just, um, you don't need much to manifest something in, into life. Okay. So you're in Kosovo, you're, you, you're still doing your, your yoga teaching. So actually before that, you must've been doing yoga for a while to become a teacher. Is that right? You were doing that on the side yes, whilst you yeah. were the director? Exactly. Yeah, I came into yoga because I, I, was, I was a marathon runner mm. and uh, a very stiff uh, marathon runner. And um, I, at a certain moment, there was a small yoga studio. I was living um, in D.C. at the time. And I started to attend some classes there. And it, it, it really caught my interest. It was not the way that... Um, I guess the, the sort of physical fitness yoga classes of today, it was, it was in the nineties and it was a more um, quieter kind of style. There was meditation and then you would pay, make some, uh, some physical shapes that we, we call that asana. You'd find the connection mm -hmm. to the ground. And, and I always felt a little bit different after those classes. I, I felt uh, different within myself. So that was my, my start. And so this would have been uh, a good 10 years later. Hmm. Yeah. So my practice had taken on uh, a direction by that time. Hmm. And, and you specialize in a particular flavor of yoga. Cause I think for some people who are maybe not aware of, about, about yoga, that there are lots of schools of different yoga, different schools aren't there. And, and you, you focus on Jiva Mukti and, can you describe how that's different from, what, from, from the other flavors and what's special about it and, and perhaps why you chose that? Yeah. Uh, well, Jiva Mukti, so Jiva is an individual. Like you're an individual and I'm an individual. And Mukti means uh, freedom or liberation. So um, the name implies that we can be free in our bodies. Being in a body doesn't mean that we have to... Uh, feel like we have shackles on. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's sort of the, the big picture of, of the practice, the frame, so to speak. And from there, not unlike Rolfing, there are pillars or, or tenets of this practice um, that include uh, uh, non-harming, uh, we call it ahimsa. Um, and that is an interesting one because of the, the face of it, it can mean, you know, just uh, I don't know, being a little bit kinder, but again, when you start to um, when you start to get to something at the root, it has sort of bigger implications, you know, about how you choose to live your life, the products you decide to buy, these kinds of, um, of things. So, so that's one aspect of it. Um, then another aspect of it is um, devotion. So uh, we call it bhakti in, in Sanskrit, but this really, um, essentially is the idea that you could offer something up to some force bigger than just your body. You know, having an idea that uh, we experience life through the body, but to be able to um, have enough grace to understand that we're not the doer, you know? Um, so that was, that's another aspect of it. Um, Let's see, we also um, do a lot of uh, study of philosophical texts. So we could call it self-study, but really um, it's referring to ancient scriptures of the yogic philosophy to like a roadmap, better understand how to be on this path of non-harming, uh, to find this sense of being a little bit more free in our, in our body and mind. 
Um, and then there's um, an aspect of sound as well. So because actually everything manifest comes from sound, this is an important practice of yoga, not just to allow the body to be an instrument, you know, an instrument with a string that's not quite in tune, doesn't sound beautiful, it's hard to, it's not resonant. And so um, we use sound, but we also um, understand that to mean that there is a sense of listening. So we, we um, the inner listening is quite important. Um, and, uh, and then lastly, meditation. In a sense, the, the yoga practice is a moving meditation. But this is something that we cultivate through this particular um, frame of yoga. So these five, um, five tenets, so to speak, create the environment for the kind of rigorous asana practice. You could say the, the hatha um, vinyasa type of, of, med, of yoga practice. And by vinyasa, I just mean um, being aware of the placement of your body in space in an order, in a rhythm that has an intention that is um, to, uh, to elevate yourself from just being chained in the body that we have. Hmm. I yeah, that makes and I can, some sense. yeah, no, no, that makes complete sense. And I can certainly concur with the rigorous asana or the rigorous uh, <laughs> aspects of Jiva Mukti. I remember a taxi, I, I got a cab once to a yoga class, and, and the guy, and I asked the taxi driver, Hey, you know, you ever tried yoga? Ever thought of yoga? So, oh, no, 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 I would never do yoga. You know, I, I want a proper workout. <laughs> it made, <laughs> made me laugh. I thought you'd never. Heard. <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, it's, it's interesting because, yes, I, I mean, I, I really um, I adore the method that my teachers have created, Sharon Gannon and David Life, and I, um, I enjoy this practice very, very much, uh, not just the asana practice, but it has enriched my life in, in a way that I would never have been able to anticipate or get from any one place. And, um, and yet at the same time, the role thing I feel has been equally as profound for me. Mm. And in a sense, I guess my, my teaching and my practice has really changed over time. Um, that uh, I, uh, the embodiment of our, our physicality has become more important. So I say this all the time, but for me, it's one of the, the most simple and profound messages. And that is, it's never the what you do, it's always the how you do it. And um, so in that way, I think that my, my yoga practice has become more fascially uh, aware. So I, I, I bring in more of the knowledge that I've gained over the years in what we would call, I guess, fascial fitness or, or keeping the, the fascia healthy of the body. Um, and I have started to intertwine these two things, not as being separate, but being very, as being very interconnected. Right. And so for people who hear fashionably aware and, and a sort of mind blown moment, yeah, what, what on earth does that mean? I mean, yeah, can you break that down a little bit in later? I mean, yeah, what, what does that really feel like? Sure. I guess um, the thing about fascia is that it's interconnected. It's throughout the body and it is interconnected. So oftentimes, for example, we think, well, I have a toe, my big toe hurts. And um, they wouldn't necessarily make the connection that the big toe is connected to the foot and the foot is connected to the ankle and the ankle is connected to the leg and the legs connected to the knee and the knee is connected to the thigh and the hip and then all the way up actually to the spine and all the way up the body. Um, but the fascia is, is what connects us. So if you would imagine kind of a skeleton, I guess, as as we know one to look, which is just the bones. And if you would imagine wrapping cling film all over that skeleton and then laying down uh, some of the musculature and wrapping that around together with the nerves and wrapping that around together with the fat and wrapping that around, you start to have a whole system that is a matrix and interconnected. So when I raise up my right arm, for example, I can raise it so that it's weak and limp and then there's nothing going on, or I can start to reach not just through the hand, but also through the pinky finger, and I can start to rate that will start to radiate down the arm and then into the shoulder, and then I realize it's not just the shoulder, the shoulder has a relationship with the rib cage and it goes all the way down. So 
the way that the fascia wraps is um, not in very neat layers, but there's actually spirals and um, these interconnections. So I guess fascially for aware for me means that there's a connection made from um, not just point A to point B, but when you engage in a certain kind of stretching or extending, there um, you can start to feel it throughout the whole body. And this becomes a much better roadmap for understanding um, where there may be blockages or where they may, may be a missing link in the way that we understand our movement. So for example, uh, you know, the hips and the shoulders are, are, are different. They're two girdles of joints moving independently. But uh, with lack of movement in our life, for example, sitting at a computer or doing a lot of travel and just not, not extending and flexing, um, these start to get held together in a way. So you, if you would think of John Wayne walking, one of his hips and one of his shoulders, they move together as one thing, not as a counter torsion thing. So um, I guess, yeah, not to get too far down the rabbit hole, um, fascially aware simply means that we are, uh, we are not separate things, but we are a differentiated body that integrates through through the fascial awareness. So, so being uh, having an understanding that um, that this exists, I guess, and that we want to get into it, um, to to use it, and you use it or lose it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, and I totally relate to the John John Wayne point because yeah, I think when I started working with you, I had the John Wayne thing going on and. I learned to find my hips and really self-conscious about that, thinking I look really fay when I first start to find my hips. So then over time realized, no, no, this is, this is what being a, being a human, using all of my body and, and feeling that connectedness means. You know, I, and I found myself walking much more efficiently and, uh, and, uh, and, and enjoying, just, just, just enjoying the simple pleasures of moving around in my body uh, to a much greater degree. Uh, and and what you said about um, the the idea that just because we this goes back to your talking about your frozen shoulder that it may be that the place you need to work on is 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 oblique to the the area of concern or the area where there's pain and I've done that with my hamstrings it's a lot of work we've we've worked all over my body um, to to address some of the 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 tightness that I have in my yeah. My hamstring, hamstrings. Sometimes the uh, analogy of a jumper, a sweater, is used where, you know, you have um, something happening in one little thread in a certain place, and then the whole jumper kind of gets set askew over time because of this little, uh, this little glitch in the fabric. And so that's kind of, um, I guess, someone who's specially aware starts to get more curious about, um, they go move maybe beyond the immediate or obvious place of pain and start to connect the dots. Not that we're all in a body of pain by any stretch of, of the imagination, but even just moving, you know, it's really, I, I, I adore observing uh, the world around me and being a part of that world. And uh, part of teaching yoga is certainly observing how people move and imagining, getting curious about what's happening underneath the layers of skin or you know, starting to get a sense um, of how is it in the fascia and where, where is the limitation really? And how can we find uh, the potential through you know, working in a little bit of a different way to, to get into that potential. And then there's that theme of freedom that comes back so that you can be more free. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the, the beautiful things about um, how Ida Rolf languaged uh, the frame of Rolfing is you know, when you're at ease in gravity, when, when you're finding your vertical line in gravity, when you are structurally somehow uh, aligned and, and present, then gravity flows through you and, and disease is not present. And um, certainly in my story of, of liver transplant and uh, all kinds of other uh, kind of side issues together with that, finding a sense of being a whole 
in a, in a severed and reconstructed body has been a, a very main theme in my personal life that has reflected in the work that I do. And that sense of being whole is, so that's at a body level, how's that played out sort of psycho-emotionally? I don't think that it's just, uh, it's not just physical, obviously, but the, the physical aspect has certainly uh, had a, a major, there's been a major physical component for me. Um, I don't know, I guess there's a, a lot of different ways I could answer that question, um, but I guess from a very, very most basic and obvious level, when I go to the liver clinic uh, every couple of months, I see a lot of people who have had transplants like me. And uh, a lot of those people can no longer use their right arm or shoulder because the tissue uh, uh, from the liver and from the surgery has become affixed. So they're pulled down on the right side or you know, there, there's a, a limitation that's, that's, you know, that impacts their life. Uh, and uh, so from a physical standpoint, I guess, um, you know, this idea that I can move in my body and I can inhabit my body and I can, uh, you know, I guess then you get into another layer of I can accept this for an object as my own. I can accept uh, the limitations that may or may not uh, be present in my life because I've had this, this moment of, you know, that, that isn't a moment because, you know, nothing's ever just a moment. I mean, we, you know, being human, uh, so much of it for me is, is being, uh, bearing witness to the moment by moment changes that are kind of intertwined through our human thread of life, you know, so there's nothing that exists in and of itself, but um, I, I guess in a sense, there's an acceptance of uh, the past and the history and the experiences that we've had that come to uh, come to fruition in this present moment of how we are, how we are embodying uh, our, our earth suit, uh, how we are um, using our time, how we are creating or, or observing or connecting or, or not, you know, all these things kind of um, have to do with, with the story of being human. And, uh, and, and mine has simply meant that I guess I have a really good roadmap, if nothing more, of um, the anatomy of the body. Of uh, I, I have a really, I feel that I've been gifted with uh, a sense of empathy for all different types of um, bodies and how they experience pain. Um, and, um, and this helps my work, it helps me to help other people. You know, uh, I had a woman who, um, had a tea, boiling tea spilled all over her uh, skin and burned, severely burned her skin to a very um, structured scars, you know, fascial scars um, that have really um, inhibited her. And, um, you know, understanding how those scars can feel like a, um, mm, uh, like an iron uh, kind of, cast, so to speak, you know, and, and the awareness that that can change through touch and movement is, um, I, I think, an extraordinary thing. Um, and so I, I guess it also has given me a lot of hope that um, we don't have to accept everything that, that happens to us, but we can accept it and we can accept our um, appeal to change uh, the direction that we're, we're going. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but mm. um, I think that a lot of us, a lot of people can tend to feel victimized that the world is um, coming at them and um, they have no control, you know, and I think that there is very little control, but one thing that we can control is, is the relationship we have with our, with our body um, and, um, and how we choose to engage or switch off from that. Yeah, that's a beautiful uh, statement. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. I can see that. That's, that's absolutely true. We we yeah. have that power. 
Yeah, and I guess where it comes into play in the, the business world, or not even that, but how we interact with other people, is um, having chronic pain in the body is debilitating. And um, I, I think that because all of our body's uh, life, the life force, however we call that, is so incredibly clever. It's magical in the way that uh, you can see it in nature best, you know, a, a tree growing through cement, for example. Um, but our bodies are like that too. And, you know, over time, and when I talk about chronic pain, sure, it can be physical, but it sure can be psycho-emotional. And, you know, there's so many different traumas that um, can manifest over one's lifetime. And to think that that doesn't somehow show up in the fabric of our body is, um, I would say, is, mm, it's a pity because there's, therein lies an experience of really manifesting big change that they, they go together. And when you start to take somebody out of a defense pattern or the pattern of trauma, then um, it can be uh, very disruptive um, and can feel uncomfortable. But at the same time, it is that disruption and that discomfort that bears fruit to another way of being, which can be a lighter, freer way of being. So we talked a bit there about your liver transplant. <laughs> so say more about that. You were you you waited for a for a long time, and yeah, talk us through that journey of the illness and and, and hmm. then through to that to the to the. Surgery. Well, you know, I had been pretty um, pretty fortunate with my digestive disease for a lot of my life. I just kind of got on with things and. Um, then, you know, at 33, I had this diagnosis, and it wasn't as physically disruptive initially as it was emotionally. And, you know, it was the disruptive, discomfortable, discomforting push that I needed to make some changes in, in my life that were positive changes. Um, but then uh, later, I, um, I became pregnant with my son, and uh, that definitely triggered a, you know, it's, it's a trauma in and of itself, carrying uh, another life in your body. And it was really probably too much for, for the liver that I had at that time to take. So that was kind of um, the catalyst for a series of kind of health events uh, over the next couple of years um, that eventually led to uh, end stage liver failure in 2000. 12, early 2013, um, which was misdiagnosed initially as pancreatitis. And uh, a lot of very weird things happened. My long-term hepatologist uh, passed away. And uh, so uh, who was kind of, I think, in denial that there was any problem. He just wanted, you know, he was, he was very unwell himself. And so I got kind of passed along to a much more direct younger uh, doctor and you know within the first day of meeting him I could hear him talking to the the medical students like this next young woman is going to need a transplant immediately and I heard them outside the window because I was in the hospital just because I was so unwell and so I was prepared and I was you know I was absolutely adamant that that did not need to happen but um, you know Disease and illness is incredibly humbling, and I think that it took me about 24 hours to come to the understanding that this was something that was going to be happening. I didn't have a choice. And, uh, you know, I, I had spent a lot of time in the hospital. I think that I went, um, you know, I went from having a really tough pregnancy to having two or three kind of little scares when my son was an infant to um, being in the hospital every week for a full week out of every month, just trying to manage the end stage liver disease because things start to shut down. So I did, um, I did my week kind of, they, they take you through a week uh, in, in house uh, assessment to get on the transplant list. They don't do transplants privately in this country. So you have to go, I was seeing a private physician and I had to go into the NHS stream. And you know, it was a moment of absolute surrender because you know, I, was, I was not British, I'm British now, but at that moment I, you know, I was not really uh, 
equipped with the information or the um, security and the, the, I guess, past experiences of trusting a system that was in place. And I didn't have a choice. So, um, you know, I, I spent a lot, of, uh, a lot of weeks in the hospital, a lot of time in the uh, A&E, you know, when I would go into kind of chronic failure. Uh, it was a, a very, very painful experience of just getting to the hospital. I remember calling a dear friend to come and take me to A&E and she kind of hoisted me into the back of her car and I remember just rolling around without a seat belt in the back of her car. We were laughing, but I was in so much pain. And um, so this kind of went on. I waited about seven months for the transplant and uh, there were a couple of false alarms. So, you know, they, they um, it has to, when you get a transplant, it has to be the uh, right size for your body and the right blood group. And my blood group was quite uh, rare. And so I, I didn't have very many chances. And the first couple of times, the, the liver, they, they have to open the person up first to see if the liver is a good quality. And sometimes it's just not. So um, I think it was the third time was a charm. <laughs> my God. And, and are you, so what's going through your mind? Is it each each day you don't get a transplant, you're, you're scared you're, you might die. I mean, what's the, it it kind of was, I was very, very lucky um, that um, the, the yoga studio where I was working were very uh, understanding. And so I really wanted to keep teaching during that time. It was mm. um, just, you know, it's a reason to get up, to have a reason to be is, the most important thing that anyone has in their life is how, why do you get up in the morning? And certainly I had my son, um, but I, I think that to be a part of um, a community, it was kind of almost a way of escaping um, that I could still continue to, to forge along. Because when I wasn't teaching or with my son or, or practicing yoga myself, I did, you know, I would read the obituaries and, uh, you know, have all kinds of thoughts about, uh, you know, I'd read pe the people that committed suicide where there was like a good organ that was just gone to waste. And it was just, you know, it was like this. I had all kinds of scenarios in my mind. And, um, and then, you know, there's the coming to terms with it, that there's been a life lost so that yours can continue. So there are many, um, there are many com complexities to, to being in that state. Wow, but yeah. uh, you, you clearly you, you got one in time and, and you're here to tell a, tell a story. Do you have any of those weird effects that people sometimes report when they have somebody <laughs> else living in I guess my taste has changed um, some. You know, I think that I used to have uh, m more of a sweet tooth than I do now. I, I, so the taste for food has, has changed. Um, I didn't get any uh, like, oh, I... I I had a memory that wasn't mine, you know, nothing like that. But I do, so I have a, my liver is now 70 years old. And I believe that um, somehow a part of integrating with my liver has meant that I, I feel like an older person. I mean, I can really relate to, um, to older people. And in some ways, I relate less to the younger side of my age. Um, so I guess that's probably, that's probably the, the biggest lasting um, effect for me is that there has been an integration causing me to perhaps feel a little more aged. <laughs> not, you don't do it. Okay, so the tastes I'm interested in. You've got some sort of strange new flavor of ice cream you now crave that you didn't before. No, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I'm more, I guess I like more sour things now. Okay. Um, so I, I, I brew um, kombucha, which is a kind of fermented tea. And I don't know that I would have really gone for that pre-transplant. I was more kind of um, uh, sweets. I loved sweets. I liked, um, you know, boiled candies and chocolate. And I, I, I liked sweet flavors. And now I like more savory things, yeah. And you've got a relationship with the family, is that right? No, um, they, so they only tell you uh, the, the sex, the uh, age, and how the person died. 
And I did write a letter after about six months to the family, but I think it's quite typical you don't hear back. Um, I, I think most, in the majority of cases, you don't hear back. I think a lot of times people are just trying to get closure. Hmm. Okay. I got one question to ask about your rolfing experience, and maybe this is for people who that this rolfing conversation has piqued their interest. What I mean, I can talk about my experience a bit, but what's your what's the biggest turnaround or, or that you've observed as a rolfer, even in your your personal practice or or other rolfers? Hmm. Well, I would love to hear your story. I keep um, yeah. because you know I, I think that would be um, I think that it is really. Um, quite remarkable. I mean, we've been working together a number of years mm. and, you know, like your toes have been, you know, uh, Richard's toes were quite um, kind of curled up and held up when we first started working and now he has a much more extended foot. So that's, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg, of course. Um, but, um, you know, there's some um, people I guess from a physical perspective, people who have scoliosis tend, you tend to see some dramatic changes. Um, you know, I, I tend to really enjoy, um, enjoy working with the integrated person. So it's, it's wonderful to see people that are more in their body and more inhabited and um, feeling more confident in these kinds of things. Um, but, you know, I think that there's also, uh, a depth, a level of depth and a richness to seeing uh, a, a transformation that happens from kind of the inside. You know, like fundamentally, um, I realize that perhaps I need to make some bigger changes in my life or uh, move country or, you know, change partners or change jobs or, uh, you know, start to uh, lose weight. I don't know. I, I find that the, um, the ability for humans to change is really uh, very profound. Uh, you know, we're just an animal. And, uh, you know, a lot of animals, when you look at the way animals live, it's very predictable. You know, a squirrel, for example, they kind of do the same thing. I mean, I don't know any personally, but I, I know from watching them around my garden that they have uh, they have kind of a remit in their life, you know, to collect mm. food, to make babies, to protect themselves, like like this. And I think that I can't really think of another um, species of animal that, um, you know, can change the continent that they're living on and... Um, change sex partners, not just saying change sex partners, but make families and intertwine those families, not lose one. And, oh, well, you know, I've just found another buck and I'm going to go have some little, um, you know, some little, I don't know, offspring with him. And my, my other kids have now flown that. No, but we, you know, humans, we have, um, we have an ability to, you know, lay a, a trail down that um, that doesn't it's not just out of breadcrumbs you know the trail that we that we leave is um, is perhaps more in some ways um, has more of a foundation or I don't really know where, where what what I'm trying to say but I guess we have a great capacity for change and a great capacity to um, to create and to um, to manifest and to express and to, um, I don't know, um, to change the fabric of culture over time. You know, and I think that um, for me, this is really a, one of the main aspects of being human that is really very fundamentally different from other earthlings. Mm. The disability to transform the circumstances of our lives and, and who we are, yeah. And hold a thread mm. and hold a thread and not forget who we were or where we came mm. from. Mm. Um, but actually to, to take that on our journey mm. and, you know, it doesn't need to be that you have a, a big baggage with all the pictures and photographs of the past, but we take a thread of it anyway in our being, in our fascial matrix, in the fabric of, of being human. And, um, you know, I think that, it's hard to know what other animals, how they, how they are, because we don't 
speak the same language in a, you know, the, from a linguistic context, but it just, it is striking how, um, how different that is. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You asked me about my journey. <laughs> so I, I, there, there could be another show, I suppose, but I mean, I suppose in a nutshell, what would I say? A nutshell talking about squirrel remits. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so, so for me, I've been doing it in conjunction with doing therapy. So, so it's, for me, it's like therapy squared or, or therapy cubed. So, so the, the talking therapy that I do acts very much on a psycho-emotional level, of course, with reference to the body. But the work we've done has allowed me a deeper access psycho-emotionally to the same themes. And they all play on each other. So I'll take some insights I get from the work I do with you into therapy and vice versa. And it, it helped me transform in terms of my personality. And especially for me, masculinity has been a huge theme in our work because I think that the way we, we express the, those gender characteristics is very physical, right? I, I think the way we hold our bodies and the stance and the way we walk. And so that's been a, a huge theme and, and that's meant more confidence and um, just... And, and, and easiness, you know, uh, an ability to be at ease with myself in life and in interactions. And then in my in my body, it's been this uh, yeah, a greater sense of freedom of movement, and and a, and a greater sense and then of, of of sway is how I'd say it. Like a, yeah, I, I, mean, I can I can sway in a way that I didn't used to. I, I used to sort of <laughs> not quite shuffle, but. Yeah, that's what, I, and then and the hamstrings, which is still my barometer, I think, for my progress is how stiff are my hamstrings. This, there's still some tightness there, and it tells me that there's still there's still more to go on this journey. But it's like, just that's completely changed. You know, I could barely touch my t toes even after more than a decade of yoga, and that's what used to frustrate me so much in yoga is I, I, you know, see somebody come in for their first yoga class and they'd be like bending down and touching their toes, and I'd be like, ah, oh, man. And um, and now that's yeah. So that's been a big change. Is it, yeah? As I say, physically is is that uh, is that flexibility? Um, but it but it goes much much deeper than that. Um, I guess one of the points that you raise that is I think quite interesting is um, you know, a lot of the the work um, whether it happens through a yoga class or or wolfing or visiting a, an osteopath or you know, going to talk therapy, there has to be a will or a curiosity at least to try something else to, for example, uh, you know, if you've always been hunched over in your seat, there has to be a will or a curiosity to perhaps explore a different way of, of being. And I guess um, what I'm trying to say really is that um, the, the biggest changes and transformations I've seen in terms of rolfing has definitely been with um, people who are going through a process of looking and um, and and with an open uh, trusting desire to make a change to get curious about why do I always use my left foot to step forward or um, you know how come I always hold the phone with my right hand or why do I always um, get so upset when somebody calls me my name in a certain way or you know whatever the pattern is it it's it can be very physical but it can most of the time the way that we hold it ourselves um tells a story about some other aspect of our of our life you know life experience mm. and the people who are curious in that as to to why we have these patterns are the ones who get the most from rolfing you would say y yes because you know, I, I feel that um, a lot of times people who are going for therapy or kind of um, especially touch therapy, touch treatments, but I guess you could maybe say the same with talk therapy is you're looking for help. You know, who, at first, the first port of call is you're looking for help. I can't do this myself or I don't know how, so I, I need to employ somebody to help me. But then there's a very large um, population within that group that is then saying, and I expect you to do it for me. So um, 
you know, this, this um, no transformation really happens by a push from, from someone else. There's got to be, you know, you're always in relationships, so there's got to be self-will that goes into that. And, um, and, you know, I would call this a joint practitionership that, you know, what you, you and I have worked very well together because there's a dialogue there and it's not just me you know, telling you what needs to happen. And it's not just you telling me what needs to happen, but we explore together. And um, through that kind of continual feedback, we, we go to new territories and, you know, because you've gone through the 10 series, so we're now doing um, post 10 series work where we can explore more. And, you know, with my- the 10 series uh, for people? The 10 series is the, um, the role thing is, uh, the role thing sessions are not just kind of one-off sessions you come once and let me fix you but um really the the full frame of rolfing how ida rolf envisioned it is is not that it's any one technique but that it is a frame of of 10 sessions in its first instance where um each session has a, a theme and a territory of the body and um, this creates a kind of road map for a journey Mm. That can be a journey of transformation. It can be a journey of being more in your body. It can be a journey of, uh, of uh, finding out how it is to breathe again or walk again, these kinds of things. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So you go into a relationship that closes, you know, at every, after every 70 minutes or 75 minutes, then, and then we pick it up when we meet again. So, you know, there's always a, a coming together and then a, a moving apart. And you, there you get space and clarity and, and then you come back together again and you, you look at it from a different perspective. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that concurs with how my experience of, 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 working, of working with you. Um, the most miraculous story I've heard other than my own is uh, a guy, uh, not saying most miraculous, really others. <laughs> One story I've heard is a guy who cured himself of epilepsy. And he claimed that he did that through a combination of therapy and, and role thing. And he said it was only when he added the role thing that uh, he got to that level of depth where he's now completely symptom free from um, decades of epilepsy. So uh, coming back to some of your original statements about it's, 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 it's potential to cure us of disease, then this is one guy, this is one anecdote. It's not a, uh, a, a peer reviewed study, uh, but, uh, it's certainly um, there's certainly evidence in its own right of of the potential um, for the for the power of this. Yeah. Okay, for people who have this has sparked their interest and perhaps want to learn more. So there's there's, there's clearly go and do some role thing. I mean, if it if somebody's not quite ready for that step, is there anything that you would suggest in terms of just a, a way to, for people to start getting a little bit more in touch with their body and to, to start on this um, path? Absolutely. I mean, so, you know, if you, if it's not, I think that um, not to scare anyone, it's not that you have to sign your life away with these 10 sessions, but I think you, you start, if you're curious, you go for one session and you okay. see how it feels, how the touch feels, how the, the rolfer resonates for you because we're all very different in our own right. Um, but also I would say, you know, go out in nature, go out to uh, a field or a beach or whatever and connect in some way. And, um, you know, so much of this is, is how expansive we can uh, allow ourselves to be. And so for me, being in nature is a way that really allows me to check in. And um, I would imagine that it releases tension in and of itself, um, which, you know, it's, it's, that's one way. Um, just going to, a, um, there are a number of classes in London now, if you're in London, that, um, that are much more uh, sort of embodied type of, of classes, practices. Um, so finding uh, any kind of movement practice that has a frame that you can be slow enough to connect dots. Um, movement classes, there's a, a whole subcategory. It could be yoga, but it could also be Tai Chi. It could be Feldenkrais. It could be an aquatic uh, movement class. It could happen uh, at, in, in any 
frame, you know, I think the first step is, is starting to um, get curious about how is it to breathe? How is it to, to be in a chair sitting? Am I slumping? When I try and sit upright, then am I holding something else in somewhere else? And, you know, if, if that's all happening and you start to get curious, then go see a rolfer at least for one session. And, um, and I think that um, that's often how it happens is it just takes that little first step, kind of like the, the yoga in uh, Kosovo is, you know, don't make a big deal of it. You make it a, a small little step and, and you give it a try once and then you kind of go from there. Right. Yeah. And if you, if you're in, in a pub and you're seeing people in leggings going behind a curtain in the back room, yeah, maybe follow them through. <laughs> Yeah, but I am teaching a workshop in June, uh, June 17th, called Embodied Yoga and Fascial Fitness. Okay. And um, it's, you know, it should be, uh, it's open to anyone. And we, we start to move in a way that will hopefully will start to connect some of those dots. So you can know what it means to be fascially aware. Okay. And, on, on that, and that's, they can find that on your website, right? You've got a website. What's yes. That? Yes. It's uh, free Liz dot com f-r-e-e-l-i-z dot com check that out and uh you've got an instagram feed as well right with I your temperature know. pictures uh... Uh, yes jiva lizzie i think i'm jiva lizzie on instagram fantastic all right thank you so much for your time and uh, yeah nice thanks for your stories okay see you soon see you